Happy Sunday, everyone. Today's musing begins with a pop quiz. I'm going to read a quote for you and then give you four options of which institution uh, or person might have said the quote. So here's the quote, and then I'll give you your four options. Approaches to the environment must be prudent, realistic, balanced, and consistent with the needs of the earth and of current and future generations, rather than pursuing the immediate vindication of personal desires or avowed rights. Okay, so there's the quote. Now, who said it? Was it A, the United Nations, B, our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, C, the World Economic Forum, or fourth, uh, the Pope with the Catholic Church? A, United Nations, B, our church, C, World Economic Forum for the Pope. What do you think? You probably guessed correctly given the, the theme and uh, overall, you know, purpose of this podcast. The correct answer is B. Uh, this quote saying that approaches to the environment must be prudent, realistic, balanced and consistent with the needs of the earth, whatever that means, was published by the church newsroom under an article titled Environmental Stewardship and Conservation. Okay, so that little pop quiz is the introduction, uh, I guess, to today's musing, uh, which comes on the heels of another church newsroom uh, article that was published just a couple days ago talking about a conference that was held in Brazil where Elder Christofferson spoke in person uh, and then presiding Bishop Cosse, I think is how it's pronounced, uh, spoke virtually. This conference, it was called Seminario SUD Americano 2023. Uh, it's basically a, a LDS adjacent type Southern American conference. And it's hosted by the non, a nonprofit foundation called Roble del Sur, based in Utah, but focused on South America. The vision for this foundation that sponsored this conference, where Elder Christofferson and Bishop Casse spoke, is, the vision is, for South America to achieve broad and sustainable development, capable principled and courageous lead, uh, individuals and groups such as Latter-day Saints and others with similar values should effectively engage in the public dialogue. So the, the, the purpose, the vision of this foundation that sponsored this whole event is to foster public dialogue in order for South America to achieve broad and sustainable development. That is a word that's going to come up throughout the remainder of this musing. And for those of you who watched, I think it was early this year, I published uh, New Year, New World Order, I think is what I titled it. Um, there will be some things I share here that I shared there, but I went to far more depth uh, on, on this, the sustainability goals of the United Nations and the church's connection to them and everything else. You can go back and listen to that one or go to sundaymusings.org um, and you can find it there. Okay, the theme of this conference that they spoke at was our stewardship of God's creation. And in Bishop Cosse's remarks, uh, I'll, I'll just quote, for, I'm going to read from the newsroom article, which was summarizing the bishop, presiding bishop's remarks uh, that he gave to this audience. And it says, because the earth is a gift, the church of Jesus Christ seeks, uh, and now they're quoting the presiding bishop, seeks to be a wise steward of natural resources through responsible management of its global operations. And then the newsroom says, this includes six major sustainability priorities outlined by the presiding bishopric. So we'll list off each of the six really quick. Again, these are the sustainability priorities of the church. Number one, increase energy efficiency and use of renewable resources. This includes more than 500 solar energy projects around the world. Number two, conserve water through water-wise landscape design, smart technology use, and water management plans. 
A recent example is the landscaping adapted to the desert area around the new Red Cliffs Utah Temple. Number three, avoid material waste through reduction, reuse, and recycling, packaging solutions, and building methods. The church, it says, recently approved the transition from 40% to 70% recycled plastic to 100% recycled plastic in our sacrament cups. Working with third-party consultants to evaluate various sustainable alternatives, the church discovered that the sacrament cups made from 100% recycled plastic will reduce overall carbon emissions compared to current cups and even paper cups. The church plans to begin using 100% recycled plastic cups in early 2024. Number four, improve air quality and reduce emissions. This includes improving the fuel efficiency of the faith's global vehicle fleet. Number five, practice sustainable design, development, and construction. With temples, for example, the church is mindful of the materials, site selection, and methods needed to support their long-term operations and maintenance in an environmentally sound manner. And then finally, number six in our list of sustainability priorities for the church. Engage in sustainable farming and ranching practices. This includes the use of cover crops, crop rotation, no-till farming, grazing management, greenhouse gas capture, and other best practices. All right. So it's like when I did the, you know, Tim Ballard thing here, you know, a couple weeks ago. You have to preface it with like, obviously human trafficking is bad, bad, but let's talk about these specifics. Obviously being a good steward of the earth and not, you know, creating a ton of unnecessary pollution or littering or, you know, whatever. Obviously it's good to be a good steward. Uh, the devil's in the details and the problem arises with the motives and ultimate goals of the law of people who uh, push and exploit these terms like sustainability and have other hidden agendas for which this is just the latest hot cause to push everyone on the social and political bandwagon. Let's talk for a moment of uh, about number three, the sacrament cups. This is the largest one. If you, if you see all these in, in the text, this number three is easily twice, if not three times longer than each of the other six items. A lot of text here saying, oh, we're switching all these, all these uh, you know, plastic cups. We're gonna be 100% recycled. I'm gonna read briefly from a uh, City Journal article last year on this topic. They say, even Greenpeace has finally acknowledged the truth. Recycling plastic makes no sense. This has been obvious for decades to anyone who crunched the numbers, but the fantasy of recycling plastic proved irresistible to generations of environmentalists and politicians. They preached it to children, mandated it for adults, and bludgeoned municipalities and virtue-signaling corporations into wasting vast sums, probably hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide, on an enterprise that has been harmful to the environment as well as to humanity. Now, Greenpeace has seen the light, or at least a gl glimmer of rationality, the group has issued a report accompanied by a press release headlined, Plastic Recycling is a Dead End Street. The group's overall policy remains delusional. The report proposes a far more harmful alternative to recycling, but it's nonetheless encouraging to see environmentalists put aside their obsessions long enough to contemplate reality. The Greenpeace report offers a wealth of statistics and an admirably succinct diagnosis, quote, Mechanical and chemical recycling of plastic waste has largely failed and will always fail because plastic waste is, number one, extremely difficult to collect, number two, virtually impossible to sort for recycling, number three, environmentally harmful to reprocess, number four, often made of and contaminated by toxic materials, and number five, not economical to recycle. And that's the end of the quote from the Greenpeace report. Here's the City Journal article continuing. Greenpeace could have added a sixth reason. Forcing people to sort and rinse their plastic garbage is a waste of everyone's time, but then making life more pleasant for humans has never been high on the green agenda. These fatal flaws have been clear since the start of the recycling movement. 
A quarter century ago, experts were already warning that recycling plastic was hopelessly impractical because it was so complicated and labor intensive. But municipal officials kept trying in the hope that somebody would eventually find it worthwhile to buy their plastic trash. Instead, they've had to pay dearly to get rid of it, typically by shipping it to Asian countries with cheaper labor and looser environmental rules. In New York City, recycling a ton of plastic costs at least six times more than sending it to a landfill. According to a 2020 Manhattan Institute study, which estimated that the city could save $340 million annually by sending all its trash to landfills. The environmental price has all, and this is the final paragraph. The, envir the environmental price has also been high because the plastic in American recycling bins has gone to developing countries with primitive waste handling systems. Much of it ends up illegally dumped, burned, spewing toxic fumes, or reprocessed at rudimentary facilities that leak some of the plastics into rivers. Virtually all of the consumer plastics polluting the world's oceans comes from mismanaged waste in developing countries. There'd be less plastic polluting the seas if Americans tossed their yogurt containers and water bottles into the trash so that the plastic could be safely buried at the nearest landfill. Okay, so I could nitpick a bunch of other things in the six sustainability priorities, but I think that is a demonstrative example to show how oftentimes these green uh, uh, initiatives are based more on political aspiration and and zeal rather than common sense, especially when you take into account uh, all the other trade-offs that arise from how we might be forced to reduce our carbon footprint and, you know, recycle plastic and everything. So the point has been made, so I will continue. Now, elsewhere in the newsroom article, it cites someone who has a title I did not know exists. This, for example, uh, I shared in that other musing that I mentioned that the church is a, a member of the United Nations Faith Advisory Council for the UN's Interagency Task Force on Religion and Sustainable Development. And that the church uh, hired a gentleman named Aaron Sherinian, who is Senior VP of Global Reach. Uh, he used to be the Chief Communications and Marketing Officer for the UN. So in that other podcast, I share a bunch of examples of the church's connections, past and present, to these kind of global agencies and globalist agendas, including the Sustainable and Development Goals, um, the SDGs. Okay, so in this newsroom article, I learned something new. I learned that the church employs someone with the title for their position of Church Sustainability Manager. Her name is Jenica Sedgwick. Here's what the article says. For example, at a recent conference in the United Kingdom focusing on women, religion, and climate change, Sedgwick heard inspiring stories of women who lead sustainability efforts around the world. And this is a quote from the church, our church's sustainability manager. She said, while each conference participant brought a diverse perspective, our shared beliefs of creation and stewardship, along with our willingness to learn from one another's varied experiences, created an undeniable sense of respect, unity, and productivity. I walked away from this conference with new eyes to see how environmental degradation impacts different communities around the world and invigorated creativity regarding potential solutions. So the church apparently has a sustainability manager. So does BYU. In fact, the BYU has a sustainability office. Their vision, and I'm quoting from their website, we envision a BYU campus and culture that cultivates lifelong stewardship by wisely managing resources in the top quartile of our defined sustainability measures. Their strategy. We aim to further demonstrate proactive, impactful stewardship by integrating sustainable practices and attitudes into all aspects of campus and alumni life including facilities, operations, scholarship, education, citizenship, and devotion. Their priorities of the BYU Sustainability Office, number one, 
Develop actions, targets, and metrics. Number two, measure and report progress. Number three, facilitate intersectional initiatives. I mean, just the lingo, the, uh, the sustainability and the intersectionality, like it's just these, these code words that pop up and you're like, I can immediately know your, your political persuasion. Okay, so, so I wanna continue quoting from Bishop Kase from his remarks at this conference that was just a few days ago. He says, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord clarified the role, uh, the role entrusted to his children regarding his creations. Quote, and he's quoting now from DNC 104. For it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward over earthly blessings, which I have made and prepared for my creatures. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and things therein are mine. For the earth is full and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things and have given unto children of men to be agents unto themselves. And then Kase points out another scripture, DNC 59, saying, And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man, for unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. And then Kase continues, For members of the Church of Jesus Christ, preserving and caring for God's creations, should be much more than a civic duty or political responsibility. It is an expression of love towards our creator and an indication of the sincerity of our gratitude for him. Now, the problem here is a lot of these bandwagoners, a lot of the you know climate change activists and the sustainability people and everybody else uh, have a wildly different definition than I do and you might when it comes to preserving and caring for God's creations, to quote, Bishop Kase right there. What does it mean to preserve and care for God's creations? Some might say we shouldn't kill any animals at all, that you shouldn't eat meat, that that should be banned because that is not preserving and caring for God's creations. Many argue, many left progressive green activists, uh, eco warriors claim that having many children uh, is a threat to climate change. There are active campaigns by these people to encourage people to have, in some cases, one or other organizations saying none, no children, uh, because humans, they allege, falsely, cause climate change. Therefore, we need fewer of them. Talk about more about that in a minute. So you might say using oil, right? You got all these like eco warriors across the world right now over the past months doing these, uh, you know, sitting down in the, in the middle of a road to block traffic, the just stop oil, I think is what they're called, or they'll go throw a, a can of oil on a classic painting in a museum to, you know, try and make the news. And so you get these these people saying that the, the use of, of fossil fuels is inherently immoral, inherently harmful to the earth, therefore, uh, they need to stop. And so what does it mean when Kase says that for members of the Church of Jesus Christ, preserving and caring for God's creations should be much more than a civic duty or political responsibility? It all boils down to your worldview and your perspective about human activity and God saying, again, uh, that we're stewards, but he's given these things to be used with judgment, right? Not, by, not to excess, neither by extortion. So either you believe that God has given us these resources to actively use prudently, right? And, and not, uh, not to excess, not, you know, going crazy, not causing any huge problems. But there are people who say, oh, the fact that you're like, I fly a lot right now. I, I've been traveling a lot lately. Uh, there are people who think that that is immoral behavior, harmful to the earth, and that I should be, I should have to offset my carbon credits, or I should be uh, capped at the number of flights I can take and on and on and on and on, because people view these, these activities as harmful. Kase continues, Caring for the earth and taking care of the men and women who live here are inseparably connected principles. Then he continues, Sharon Eubank, the church's director of humanitarian aid, has observed that a major reason for population displacements in the world is the degradation of people's natural environment. She said, now he's quoting Sharon Eubank, some people will say, isn't there something more important to do? Shouldn't we be caring for the poor as opposed to caring for the earth? And my question is, are they not so inextricably linked that we cannot succeed if we do one but neglect the other? 
Now, again, from that podcast earlier this year, I went into far more depth into Sharon Eubank and her collusion with all these globalists and connecting the church to all these globalist agendas. Uh, I'll just mention one of those things that I mentioned in that podcast. So this is from 2019 when the United Nations held their civil society conference in Utah. I attended that to kind of see what it was all about. And uh, the conference was focused on, and I'm quoting from a church article about this, uh, it was focused on creating sustainable and inclusive cities and communities. Sister Eubank explained just how closely the goals of the two global organizations are aligned in that purpose. She's saying the United Nations and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the goals of these two institutions, she alleges, are aligned in trying to create sustainable and inclusive cities and communities. It continues, over the past six or so years in her work with Latter-day Saint Charities, Sister Eubank said, the predominant focus has been with refugees. If you look at why people, this is now quoting her, if you look at why people are forced from their homes, it's because of intolerance versus inclusiveness and because of environmental degradation, because they can't afford to stay or the climate doesn't allow them to stay. Now, Bishop Kase a few days ago cited Eubanks saying this same thing, talking about the degradation of the natural environment as a, a cause for reason for population displacement. Therefore, we need to care more for the environment, stop climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Now, he cited in his footnote for that, the source of her remark was from a website uh, called ldsearthstewardship.org. And so, so that's where he grabbed Sharon Eubanks' quote from. I thought that was curious. What is this you know, website that the presiding bishop is now citing as a credible source and, and Sharon Eubanks' quote? So LDSEarthStewardship.org is a nonprofit that helps church members, quote, build sustainable habits with your congregation. This organization has created a ward sustainability guide to help members, quote, make their church practices more eco-friendly. They say at the beginning of this resource, this ward sustainability guide, again, go download it yourself, ldsearthstewardship.org. They say, we have created this sustainability guide to help stake, ward, and branch leaders encourage their congregations to use fewer resources, build sustainable habits, and practice the principle of earth stewardship in their church activities. So what are some examples? What, what is this organization and, and people who believe like this, this whole sustainability nonsense, I shouldn't say it's nonsense. We, you know, I run an organization. I want my programs to be sustainable. I want them to be able to survive long term. We want an earth that is sustainable. The the word itself, it's like gay. Gay used to, you know, mean happy. Now it means something else. Words change over time. People impregnate them with political implications and so forth. And uh, and so too is sustainability. I don't think anything's inherently wrong with it. But what people mean by it and the political, uh, um motives and agendas connected to it and the worldviews of the actors using the term completely change it. So I'm all for sustainability, but not the kind that most sustainability managers and directors and advocates and activists think of when they think of sustainability. Okay, let's get to the examples. This is from the Ward Sustainability Guide pushed by LDS Earth Stewardship, an organization cited by the presiding bishop in this uh, this the remarks he gave a few days ago. He didn't quote them by name. It was a footnote where he was capturing Sharon Eubanks' quote. So I want to be clear about that. Here's the examples. Number one, ward activities, especially ones during which a meal is served, can traditionally be a significant source of paper, plastic, and other waste. Consider using an alternative to single-use plates, silverware, and cups. Perhaps encourage ward members to bring their own dishes and silverware or at least their own water bottle. <laughs> okay, let's do another one. Again, from the Ward Sustainability Guide. There are, the, I'm quoting, there are many alternatives to traditional paper programs used for sacrament meeting and other meetings. Programs can be emailed to ward members beforehand or shared via a QR code in the lobby. 
printing just one slightly larger program to leave in the lobby for attendees to check on their way in is also an option. Most other announcements can also be distributed digitally. So now they're saying, using paper is bad, stop printing programs. Here's another one. In areas where it's feasible, encourage walking, biking, or taking public transit to church or church activities. Ward leaders could even encourage one Sunday a month where ward members leave their cars at home and use alternative transportation. In areas where walking, biking, and public transit are not possible or practical, encourage carpooling to church and church activities. Right. All right, final example from that I'm going to share. There's other stuff in here. From the Ward Sustainability Guide, it says, each ward or stake could have a, <laughs> a designated sustainability specialist, sustainability coordinator, or, quote, green team leader as a calling. Responsibilities could include, number one, attending ward council once a quarter to make recommendations. Number two, working with activity... Uh, the activities committee to plan sustainable meals and earth stewardship oriented service activities. Number three, monitoring, recycling, or composting bins at the church. Number four, organizing or encouraging carpooling. Number five, teaching classes, lessons, or workshops on earth stewardship or sustainability related topics. Oh boy. All right. Lots to say. I'm actually going to move on to a poll that I think recently, uh, not too long ago, came out. Uh, I'm, I got this from a uh, from a, a Utah media website. They did, there was this poll that they were announcing from the Public Religion Research Institute. It was a nationwide survey asking thousands of Americans their thoughts on in this case, climate change, and they broke down the responses by affiliation. According to the poll results, only one in 10 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints view climate change as a crisis. Fewer than half, 48%, believe human activity is fueling climate change. On the one hand, I'm surprised it's that high. On the other hand, with all the propaganda about it, I'm, I'm not surprised it's that high, especially through government schools. It continues... LDS respondents had some of the lowest responses for both of those questions about uh, viewing it as a crisis, climate change, and number two, believing that human activity is, uh, is fueling it. They were also, they meaning us Mormons, they were also the second lowest religious group when it came to supporting policies to combat climate change, such as funding renewable energy taxing fossil fuel companies, and capping vehicle emissions. When asked if having a God-given role as stewards who care for the earth is important to them, 84% of LDS respondents said yes, the highest of any religious group. So, so our highest in terms of seeing ourselves as stewards of God's creations, that all these things are a gift to be used you know, for, by, by man with our agency and so forth, but almost lowest, second to lowest in supporting any of the progressive so-called solutions to so-called human-caused climate change. Continuing now, they, it says the disconnect between the church's love for the earth and a lack of urgency about climate change is sobering but not surprising to Ben Abbott, an ecosystem ecologist at BYU and board member of Mormon Environmental Stewardship Alliance. He says, and I quote, many members of the church haven't realized how directly their strong beliefs about being caretakers of the earth and good stewards, they haven't seen how that connects to climate change, though it does in very direct ways. And then he goes on to say a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, including, I don't think this was him, there was someone else they quoted in this article saying, alleging that, uh, that the LDS church's apocalyptic beliefs disincentivize people to be good stewards of the earth. The idea being that because we think Jesus is coming back and the world's going to be a go to hell in a handbasket and there's going to be all kinds of, you know, bombs and wars and all kinds of shenanigans happening and, and volcanoes and, and tempests and natural disasters that are going to screw up the climate anyways, what's the point? So that's the, that's the idea. They're concerned that our so-called apocalyptic beliefs around the second coming impede people from 
Uh, but, but it's a fair point. I mean, when one volcano can spew far more CO2 than like all the businesses in the country combined for, you know, 10 years or whatever the, the data point is, I, I'm making that up. Uh, but it's something huge like that, that one volcano is just this astronomical thing. Then, then, then forcing people and punishing people and taxing people for these super marginal, like uber, uber marginal, statistically insignificant impacts is ridiculous. And it's basically a, a toehold for this kind of neo-Marxist effort to control people's actions uh, centralized power into large monolithic government apparatus, and ultimately reduce the human population. We've got Elder Stephen Snow as well saying, uh, this was, I think, a, a few years ago at another sustainability uh, eco-type conference. He said, climate change is real, and it's our responsibility as stewards to do what we can to limit the damage done to God's creation. Okay, well, like, yes, we're stewards of, of, of God's earth. One can acknowledge that climate change is real. The climate changes all the time. It ebbs and flows. It's hot. It's cold. We were all freaking out about global cooling decades ago, and now everyone freaked out about global warming, and then they changed the term to climate change to get around that awkward fact that they were, like, whipping us around and what we should be cared about. Sure, the climate changes all the time. Look at the historical record. Just lots of ebbs and flows and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so you, so you can believe that, like Elder Stephen E. Snow says, Stephen Snow, minus the E, climate change is real. Sure, fine, the climate changes. Uh, we are stewards of the earth. Sure, fine. But then he says that we have a responsibility to limit the damage done to God's creation. Is it damage to cut trees down, to use them to build homes and ships and furniture and stuff? Is it, is it damage to fly on a plane because it's emitting carbon dioxide? Is it damage to the earth to have a large family and produce a bunch of humans who each contribute to the, the so-called problem? Like, what is damage? And, and, and these words, you read all these like LDS, eco, green activist -y people in their organizations, they are clinging to like any, anything, like they all quote that little Elder Snow uh, thing, right? Oh, look, he said, he said, we have to limit the damage. And of course, they believe that the damage is X, Y, and Z, whereas I might be like, that's just living life and it's not actually damaging. Let's remember, please, that CO2 is plant food. I mean, it's been horribly demonized uh, carbon dioxide. I would point you to a couple resources. The first one is CO2coalition.org. Um, they have a bunch of little factoids and charts there to, to basically argue the case that CO2 is a good thing. It's been heavily demonized, but it, it's actually a, a positive thing and helps you know the world kind of grow and thrive. So uh, that's one resource. Another one is Alex Epstein's website. It's energytalkingpoints.com. And so he goes through and dispels a whole bunch of myths. Alex Epstein, by the way, has a fantastic book called Fossil Future that I highly recommend if you're sick of all the eco-propaganda being shoved down your throats by the media and academia and social media and everybody else. So go read Fossil Future. And he, so the subtitle of it is Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. Of course, that sounds horrifying to all of these LDS eco sustainability, et cetera, right? Because they've all been conditioned in a certain worldview that demonizes carbon dioxide and fossil fuels. And uh, you get this groupthink echo chamber of all these so-called academics that say that there's consensus, just like they did for COVID and all that nonsense. There's consensus that humans are causing global warming, that we need to reduce our carbon footprint and on and on and on and on. So then they prescribe their policies, which are neo-Marxism and ultimately an effort to reduce human prosperity and population. All right. So, I mean, it reminds me of Paul Ehrlich, right? This is the guy who wrote the population bomb decades ago. I think I've talked about him on a past musing 
on some related topic. I can't remember off the top of my head. But this is the guy who famously wrote The Population Bomb, predicting that there would be mass starvation and death, that the population was growing too large, that we needed to suppress the population, have fewer children because we were consuming our scarce resources too quickly. And, uh, and so he prescribed all kinds of solutions, which are horrifying, various degrees of horrifying to limit the population. Uh, and, and even more like sinister things like, like forcing uh, TV shows and movies to uh, not feature large children, to culturally normalize only having one child, for example, and, and effectively brainwash people into thinking that that was the culturally acceptable thing to do for the environment. And of course, what he didn't account for was human ingenuity and innovation, that there have been all kinds of technological advancements regarding especially agriculture, but many other things, energy production and so forth, that has skyrocketed uh, the, the production of resources and the acquisition of re extraction of resources and the abundance that exists. So, so I will remind us of the quote from DNC 104. Uh, let's see, it's right here. Okay, so it says, the earth is full and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things. The, the people, the, the Paul Ehrlichs of the world, the Greta Thunbergs, the, all the eco-green progressive people operate from a, a doom and gloom scarcity mindset about the Earth's current resources, and 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 overestimate and and over hype the impact of humans, uh, alleging that they are the reason why the Earth is heating up and why there's more hurricanes supposedly, even though there's really not, and on and on and on and on because they're believing what they're hearing from some whack job scientist who is funded by some lefty green nonprofit or foundation, and they're pushing a particular agenda that's very favorable to the elite globalists who want to centralize power. Like I'm looking at an article right now from The Guardian. Uh, they say, that this is the title of the article, want to fight climate change? Have fewer children. Right? Like, it's not just crazy fringe people out there saying this. this is, these are ideas that all rest on the presumption of human causality with climate change, meaning that humans produce carbon dioxide, both individually, but also technologically and through their consumption of resources, and that that's a net negative, and we need to save the earth, and we need to not damage the earth, and we need to protect the earth. Therefore, humans need to knock it off, and there need to be fewer of them. So have fewer babies. Yet God is saying, multiply and replenish the earth. I find that fascinating. I didn't pull up the, I can pull up the 1828 uh, dictionary, which we love to quote from uh, because it's such a helpful way to understand the kind of definition of words that were used at the time. I do recall I've talked about this in the past musing, but here is the definition of replenish. When God says multiply and replenish the earth, here's the understanding of the word replenish 200 years ago, closer to when the King James Bible was done and, and the modern revelations, and so forth. Okay, replenish means to fill, to stock with numbers or abundance, to finish or complete. It even cites Genesis 1, multiply and replenish the earth as an example of the use of, of the term. So, so multiply, have babies, and fill the earth. Finish and complete the earth, if we're using that second definition. Complete the earth. The earth is incomplete without all the humans that God has had in store. And keep in mind, again, quoting DNC 104, God said, I prepared all things. The earth is full and there is enough and to spare. This is an abundance mindset. God knows how many spirit children that he and heavenly mother created. Uh, he knows how many would come to live on this earth uh, he knows all those things. He's prepared sufficient natural resources for all of them and an overabundance. There's enough and to spare. And, and so he knows all these things and he's prepared all these things. And he knows that, you know, despite the Paul Ehrlichs of the world, that only a few years later, there's going to be these inventions and, and advancements that are going to produce prosperity and abundance far beyond anything the doom and gloomers could have predicted. 
And yet, I mean, Paul Ehrlich was quoted earlier this year on 60 Minutes as an expert, even though the guy has long been massively discredited decades ago when he wrote that book and increasingly since. So these, these naysayers, these doom and gloomers all operate from a scarcity mindset about available resources on the planet, about the sustainability of having a large population. And, and they're basically working counter to the interests of God who has commanded us to multiply and replenish the earth, despite the guardian telling us to fight climate change by having fewer children so, so that violates God's strict commandment to multiply and fill, complete, finish the earth by bringing all these spirit babies down to earth, right? But it's also just wrong. Greta Thunberg, five years ago, a little over five years ago, this was June, she posted on Twitter. Uh, she quoted from, from this article, it said, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. And that was over five years ago. It's like Al Gore with an inconvenient truth, right? Warning about the, the ice caps are all going to melt within X number of years and then that time passes. And these people are all fools. They, they, they don't have any inspiration for what they're doing. They're, they've bought into an agenda that sees humanity as a stain on the earth this basically ties back to all the old idolatry of worshiping Mother Gaia and, and you know, these, the sun and everything, these, these resources that God has given us. And yet people elevate those resources over humans. This is an anti-human agenda to the point where they're saying produce fewer humans. Don't have as many babies. That is the logical and natural implication and extension of this type of perspective and worldview. And there are people in our church who share that worldview. There are sustainability managers and sustainability initiatives. And look, fine, like use fewer resources if it makes sense for your project, but don't use fewer resources because there's some moral high ground in doing so. God has given us enough and to spare. Don't self-flagellate. Don't beat yourself up to look like you're part of, you know, an obedient soldier in the green agenda, right? Don't claim that all these ill social uh, and economic ills stem from the degradation of people's natural environment as, as Eubank did. And the human caused climate change is, you know, a, a basis for all these things. Um, <laughs> and continue printing your church programs each week and drive to work if you want and fly on planes and all these things, because contrary to all the nonsense that is crammed down everyone's throat, CO2, despite being heavily demonized, is, I mean, do we think that God didn't know that there would be carbon dioxide? Do we, do we think that like, oh crap, we now need to alter course. And like, it's just, it, it's, it's the arrogance of, of the position and, and the evilness of the position to claim that humans are the cause. Because how do you argue that point and then also not argue that there should be fewer humans or that humans should have no freedom or far less freedoms to produce resources the way they want. You look at the countries that are using a ton of energy, they're the ones that lift themselves out of poverty. It's not just charity and endless giving to people. You look at the third world countries that have been able to spike their energy consumption, they're applying that energy consumption to technological innovation. They're creating tools and resources and systems to lift themselves out of poverty. No longer needing aid and charity in this just one way thing. They're, they're using energy that God has provided for us on this earth they're using this energy to better their lives. Why wouldn't we want that? It, it is an anti-human agenda ultimately for many of these people. And so they use these terms and now it's the socially acceptable. We're all sustainable and diverse and equitable and inclusive and intersectional and, and everything else. But at the root of it, there are people with a wildly diverging worldview and agenda. No, that's not to say all the frontline soldiers understand what the backroom elite are doing and what they desire. Of course not, right? There are a lot of people who just want to virtue signal and show that they're part of the solution and they're fighting for the cause and they're, they're finding meaning and identity in this, you know, political effort because largely they're secular humanists or, or atheists or, you know, don't care about God, but they find meaning and purpose in, 
in effectively worshiping the earth and seeing that humans are the enemy. They are the problem. This is ultimately the agenda at the core of this whole thing. Not that every frontline soldier is bought into it, just like not every teacher in a government school understands the, the kind of evil collectivist uh, beliefs and worldview of the early architects of that system. Not all the people involved understand or even share that perspective, and yet the system is built in a way to manifest and implement the worldview of the people who created it. It goes with government schools. I would say it goes with a lot of these sustainable and development goals that are being pushed by the UN and other globalist institutions. So there you have it. Some more church connections, uh, including Bishop Kase a couple days ago, revealing, at least to me, uh, I, you know, that there's a sustainability director at the church. That led me to realize the BYU has a sustainability office, that they're buying into this idea that, you know, we should recycle and that's somehow a, you know, moral good. And uh, it, it just, I, I don't know, it, it sustainability is fine, right? Uh, be be a good steward, but it all comes down to what you perceive to be damage, right? What you perceive to be environmentally sound. Because from that definition, however you answer that question, there are wildly different applications of human behavior. And there are people who think that your existence is damaging the earth. And in the aggregate, many other humans' existence is damaging the earth. So the devil's in the details. And I don't know what Bishop Kasse thinks. I don't know what Elder Christofferson thinks or even the church's sustainability manager. Maybe they don't buy in all this leftist nonsense despite attending all these conferences put on and attended by lefty, progressive, eco-warrior type people by and large. Maybe they are immune to all those influences and social pressures and propaganda and everything else. Maybe they're just these amazing people who can remain fixated on an abundance mindset that God in scripture has told us and taught us as it relates to the earth's resources. Maybe, maybe, but I doubt it. See you next week.